Additional funding for Axe Handle Saturday has been provided by Johnson & Johnson Vision Care. Almost no film footage survives of Axe Handle Saturday. Almost no photographs. What little there is remained locked away for half a century, until now. August 27, 1960. A horrifying day in Jacksonville history. The day white men, hundreds of them, roamed our city's downtown streets and beat blacks bloody with axe handles. Precisely 1,651 miles from downtown Jacksonville, Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. Fire. Here, they're doing research that's truly out of this world. It was our job to determine what effects space travel would have on the human body. Alton Yates, Jacksonville native, then 23, airmen, second class. The United States had fallen way behind in the space race. We conducted all kinds of experiments. We did studies to test the effect of rapid acceleration and deceleration on the human body. The mission is urgent. The Soviets' launch of the Sputnik satellite two years earlier terrified the U.S. You are hearing the actual signals transmitted by the Earth-circling satellite. Fear, literally, is in the air. But at Holloman, fear is found on the ground. I did it 65 times. The equivalent of 500 miles an hour and stopping at something like one and two tenths seconds. It was like you ran straight into a stone wall head on at hundreds of miles an hour. But when Alton Yates is discharged in the fall of 59, he slams into something else a hatred just as dense and thick and impenetrable as any stone wall. Driving from Holloman back to Jack's, wearing his Air Force uniform, he stops to eat at a greasy spoon. A huge, looked like a professional football player, white guy, walked up behind me. And he used the N-word and told me if I didn't get my black so-and-so out of there, they would kick my Now this is something new. Holloman, after all, was colorblind. No hint of any racial discrimination, segregation, prejudice, none whatsoever for four and a half years. But now, he could barely make four and a half miles without a slur from a storekeeper. I was made to feel as though I was less than an animal. So Alton Yates buys a loaf of bread, a jar of Jif, some jam, a few plastic knives, and let that serve as breakfast, lunch, and dinner in this strange new world. I promised myself that if I could just get home, then I would give as much of my time and effort to trying to eliminate those kinds of conditions that I gave to trying to see to it that man could travel into space. What is race? What do we really know about race? More than half a century after Axe Handle Saturday became a buried part of Jacksonville's past, a traveling exhibit appears at Mosh. The message is that we are one race, one human race. A message that would never fly, an exhibit that would never happen in the Jacksonville of 1960. Race is a short word with a long history in the United States of America. My grandparents were loving and good people and they were racist. They've both died and I wish they were here now to see this exhibit because I'd want them to see it with me. 
an exhibit offering as many questions as answers. The science of this exhibit probably will surprise some people. This exhibit is based on fact. It's not based on emotional reactivity. It's not based on supposition. It's based on data that most of us in our era weren't taught in school. And today, hundreds of Duval County school students, rambunctious ones, some only six years old, take on the exhibit. At this age, they don't have any prejudice whatsoever. Hi, let's go. <laughs> As they get older, you know, seeing different things out in the world, then that's when they start learning the different prejudices. This is the age group that will carry the voice that will move the needle, removing racism as the barrier that it is in our society now. Nicholas is one of your best friends? Is Nicholas black? Yes. Does he notice the difference in skin color? Mm, no, he doesn't pay any attention to that. You don't even think about that, do you? I don't know if that I'm only in first grade. <laughs> it doesn't matter the color of your skin or where you come from. We're all one people. We all have the same heart. It's just a different skin color. We all come from East Africa. The reality is we're all African Americans. In the biblical sense, uh, we are all brothers. I think that is the core of the lesson to be learned. But even in 2013, Hello. Hi. even in this playful setting, Hi. race can still strike a nerve. Do you think this race exhibit will be a sensitive spot for some people? I think that the exhibit's going to be challenging for some people. I think the exhibit's going to be validating for some people. It is a sensitive subject. But we are a museum, and a museum is a safe place for public dialogue. By 1776, when all men are created equal was written into the Declaration of Independence by a slaveholder named Thomas Jefferson, a democratic nation was born with a major contradiction about race at its core. One thing that surprised me a lot when I first learned about it was the Constitution talking about all men are created equal, yet they still had slaves and considered them property, they weren't even counted. When people are challenged to explore deeply embedded beliefs, that's okay. This isn't supposed to be just flowers and rainbows. This is supposed to be challenging. And interactive. Like this, visitors providing instant feedback on scraps of paper. It's low tech, but high impact. What has surprised me is the tenderness of people's hearts about this content, about race, about difference, about stories, about their own memories, and their willingness to share it. Do you have friends who are black? Mm-hmm. Are they good buddies of yours? Definitely. Does it make any difference to you if people are black or white? Not really, actually. I've learned that especially um, that the only difference in race and skin color is the amount of melanin in your skin. And it's kind of weird how people make a really big deal off of that. Maybe just something crazy in the brain. Consider how your view of a painting can change as you examine it more closely. We invite you to do the same with race. The race exhibit leaves Mosh in Jacksonville around the end of April. If only our differences could disappear so quickly. Back in Jacksonville, Yates met Rutledge Pearson, a prominent civil rights activist, a school teacher, just someone that every kid looked up to. We thought he was the smartest person in the world. Very verbal, very sociable, a leader in the local NAACP. He was a people person, and he liked to talk, and I liked to talk, and we liked the same thing, so that's how we got together. Also quite the athlete, played pro ball, almost. He did not get a chance to play with the Jacksonville Seabirds at Jacksonville Beach. They turned the lights out of the park. They, they didn't want him to play on the team. Tall, handsome, charismatic, a commanding presence. With a beautiful baritone voice. And a sympathetic ear. A lot of adults don't listen to teenagers. Pearson did. And even though school board officials stood by his classroom door more than once, 
snooping and spying, checking for insubordination. Rutledge Pearson's baritone tongue lashed the white system hard, starting with his unsparing assessment of the standard issue American history textbook. He would hold up the book and very dramatically he would give you all the information of the book. How many chapters, how many pages, just go through a spiel, minute, minute and a half. Then he would slam the book down and then he would tell us, leave it home. Rodney Hurst, when he got to Pearson's eighth grade history class at Isaiah Blocker Junior High, he was a still precocious 11 year old, so smart he had skipped a grade. That was the, the defining point in my life in really getting a chance to discuss at length in a classroom forum and setting what segregation and racism was all about. And somewhere along the way, Pearson did the unthinkable. He encouraged us to join the Youth Council NACP. I mean, that is just blasphemous. Pearson was an advisor to the Youth Council. By 1960, Rodney, then a high school senior, was council president. Alton Yates, the Air Force vet, was vice president. They met at Laura Street Presbyterian Church downtown, along with dozens of young blacks. Some committed to the cause, some just curious, but nearly all very, very young. Most of these kids were middle school and high school age. Maybe that's why they called Pearson the Pied Piper of the movement. He challenged us to press forward, don't accept the status quo. That's something that we as young people, we were just hungry to hear. Hungry? Well, go grab a bite at a downtown lunch counter. Sandwiches, sundaes, and best of all, the smoothest milkshakes in town. Just one catch. They only serve vanilla. Back at Mosh, just around the corner from the squealing kids running around the race exhibit, we slip away to another display off to a quiet corner of the museum and discover artifacts that take us back six decades and 53 years to the Jacksonville of 1960. 1960 was a big year. It was the beginning of the movement, and I think it was the beginning of what we're still fighting for today. Here's our conventional Jacksonville couple of the 60s, June and Ward. As you can see, they're white. June and Ward live in a modest but comfortable three-bedroom in one of Jacksonville's very segregated suburbs. We were so segregated that living on the north side going to Andrew Jackson High School could not have been more segregated. Generally, the segregation in this community was so complete that it was really not a matter that was much thought about. June and Ward's neighborhood is nothing fancy, but a park's nearby and the street's pretty good, just the occasional pothole. Black neighborhoods didn't have paved street, didn't have sidewalks, didn't have garbage collection. June and Ward, born, raised in Jacksonville, high school graduates, both in their mid-20s, don't think very often about blacks and segregation and prejudice. From time to time, I questioned it, and it was just a question. It wasn't a matter of indignation. It took a while to build any sense of indignation, I think. I think that's true of most of us in the South. Ward is blue collar. He makes about five or 6,000 a year. June takes care of the house, and Molly, now four, an avid consumer of Tang. She drinks a glass every morning, just like the astronauts. Two years from now, Molly starts first grade at Brentwood Elementary, one of Duval County's all-white public schools. The Duval County School Board, their doctrine was separate but equal. Well, there was a whole lot of separation, but no equality whatsoever. Not that white schools were all that great, in a few years, all 15 of Jacksonville's high schools would lose accreditation, an enormous embarrassment to the city. But the black schools were even worse, decrepit and dilapidated. The insults were there in school. It's hand-me-down furniture and hand-me-down supplies and the hand-me-down books. It made me feel bad to use used books that had been written all through and torn up, hardly a cover on it. June and Ward don't know much about that. For them, life is fine and getting better. Just last week, Ward got a new suit at Sears. 
38 bucks. The Sears downtown, about the only place where June and Ward see black people. I remember going to Hemming Park, downtown Jacksonville, and seeing the water fountains, white only, colored only, and it didn't make sense to me at the time. That's the way it was. You didn't question that. But even downtown, June and Ward don't talk to black people or acknowledge them. They pass them on the sidewalk, and that's about it. Oh, sure, we saw the colored and white water fountains. We didn't see blacks in restaurants. We didn't see them in hotels. We saw them downtown, but they tended to congregate together. We just did not mix. Like at the downtown Woolworth, blacks shop there. They buy whatever they want, go anywhere in the store, except the all-white lunch counter. And June and Molly, they noticed there's black people in Woolworth. Like last week, there was one standing behind them at the counter. If you were at the counter first to purchase something and a white person came up afterwards, then that white person would be waited on first. June and Molly love Woolworth. The milkshakes are creamy, the price is cheap, the service fast, and the employees polite. My grandmother at that time had to be close to 80 years old. And when she talked to the young clerks in the store, she would have to answer them yes ma'am and no ma'am, yes sir and no sir. That struck me as being odd as far as the way they treated my parents. No respect for them whatsoever. June and Ward don't have air conditioning yet, but they've got new appliances. Refrigerator, stove, dishwasher, and parked in the street, a 54 Studebaker, a hand-me-down from June's dad, it's their only car, so when Ward's at work and June and Molly need to go somewhere, they take the bus. Blacks are there, too, though they ride toward the back. After all, that's what the sign says. I was living in New Orleans, Louisiana at this time. There were times that I would get on the bus, and when no one was paying attention, I would take the sign and throw it out of the window. Blacks were supposed to be behind that sign. And within moments, there was utter confusion on the bus because nobody knew where to sit. <laughs> I was in a junior high and high school when I did that. You did that how many times? I certainly did that a dozen times. Really? Yeah. Were you pleased with yourself afterwards? I was pleased. <laughs> it's Saturday morning, so Molly's watching Mr. Wizard on the family's black and white. Tonight, the three of them will tune into Channel 4 at 7 o'clock for Amos and Andy, a tremendously popular comedy based on black stereotypes and on television since 1951. Aside from Amos and Andy, June and Ward hardly ever see blacks on TV, just like in real life, and they're good with that. For the great majority of Jacksonville residents, yes, they were white supremacists and believed in segregation. June and Ward... Nice, decent, hard-working, church-going people. They don't burn crosses, they don't spew hatred, and they don't like those postcards, the ones depicting blacks as alligator bait. June thinks they're vile, but they've been sold in stores all over Florida for decades. During that period of time, they were a common item. I could have walked into a drugstore and bought one. Yes, definitely. You would not have had difficulty at all. <laughs> The sad thing is that people would buy them. I mean, that bespeaks something damaged in the soul of the people who thought these were just picturesque as hell and bought them and sent them back to their friends and family and neighbors in Indiana and Maine and Connecticut and wherever. Though June and Ward never bought any of those postcards, they still believe blacks should stay in their place, away from white neighborhoods, white schools, and especially away from their daughter. The core of white supremacy is the fear of intermarriage. They were so afraid of their daughters being attracted to black men, black boys. Separation, segregation. In August 1960, most whites in Jacksonville felt this way. This would cover everybody from Mayor Hayden Burns to most lawyers, cops, firefighters, school teachers, and you name it. It was a, really a tale of two cities, a white city and a black city. And the white part of Jacksonville had the power. 
June and Ward don't even know black kids this very morning are demonstrating at Jacksonville's downtown lunch counters. Local news hasn't made much of it. Now, sure, they've heard of things happening in other cities, but sit-ins, picket lines, that wouldn't happen here. Not in Jacksonville. Our Negroes are good ones, thought June and Ward. They won't cause any trouble. They know their place. Jacksonville was probably one of the most segregated cities in the South. Everything around me was segregated. Including most everything downtown. Back then, thriving, booming, the swanky spot to shop and socialize. But below the glow of gleaming new buildings, glorious hotels, grand stores, and glitzy restaurants, loomed a shadowy netherworld populated solely by black shoppers. For them, a trip downtown was always dicey and definitely dehumanizing. If you were black, be prepared to deal with discrimination from the top of your head to the tip of your toes. They would not allow black women to try a hat on. They had to buy that hat without trying it on. And the same with shoes. You bought a pair of shoes and you took it home. You found out that they were too small. You couldn't take them back. They were yours. In the eyes of the salesperson, it was contaminated. Go outside the stores and downtown got even worse. Try window shopping? And that car with whites in it would yell out, niggas get out the way. Or drinking some water? Bad black water, white water, yes. You ever try any of the white water? <laughs> I laugh because I work downtown. And ironically, I had a habit, and I guess I can talk about it. I would go by the water fountain, and every time I go by, I change the signs. <laughs> so people come through the day that may be drinking some colored water, the morning may be drinking some white water, but they, it, it never was questioned. It was never questioned. So you change the signs. I do it every, every time I pass the water fountain, I would change them. Yeah. But at the crux of all this, the thing that really stuck in your craw, the lunch counters, off limits if you were black. You could shop all day long in the stores, but you couldn't sit down and eat at the lunch counter. You would get angry about it, but then you would channel that anger by confronting the system in a way that took more courage than anger to do, and that's what we did. But as Rutledge Pearson always said, freedom is not free. Trouble is, this transaction had an enormous price because children would pick up the tab. The whole sit-in movement began up in North Carolina in Greensboro. Once it happened in Greensboro, we were ready. We wanted to move right then. But Rutledge Pearson knew that sitting while black at an all-white lunch counter required more than just sitting. So did Arnett Gerardo, then 31 years old, an advisor to the Youth Council. Racial desegregation was not something that I could conceive at 31 years old. It was so entrenched, but we were willing to take the steps to at least confront it, whether we won or lost. So the kids devised plans. We did not approach this haphazardly. They denounced violence. That was absolutely forbidden. They developed procedures buy something at another counter to show that you would accept my money at one counter and wouldn't accept it at the lunch counters. And on Saturday, August 13th, at the downtown Woolworth lunch counter, the kids in the NAACP Youth Council sat down. The people were, like, shocked when we showed up. Whites stood behind us, and they couldn't believe it. Blacks stood behind us, and they wanted to applaud. But everyone, black and white, was speechless, except for the waitress. You can't sit there. You can't sit there. What are you doing over here? And we said, no, we're just here, and we want to order. Can we have a menu? She was really, I would say, in a tizzy. She did not know what to do. But the manager did. Woolworth, close the lunch counter, turn the lights out. 
leaving the kids to face a grim crowd of increasingly angry white people who wanted their cheeseburgers, with none of this nonsense on the side. They just simply left. They finished their food as fast as they could, and they left, or they told her to wrap it up, and they'll take it with them rather than sit there. We did what we came to do. We came to occupy the lunch counter. And as long as we occupied the lunch counter, nobody was being served. And Woolworth wasn't making any money. That marked a turning point. Discrimination did not disappear in Jacksonville that day, but it suddenly became way more expensive. I was fired after the first sit-in. For two weeks in August, the NAACP Youth Council sat in at lunch counters all over downtown, leaving white customers agitated, the white establishment antsy, and Rodney Hurst out of a dishwashing job. Came back to work on Monday and my job was, it was gone, you know. For Alton Yates, a happier event occurred about a week into the demonstrations. He got married. When you get married on a Friday and, and that Saturday your husband's out in a demonstration, it's scary. Even more scary? the staggering war stories the kids accumulated over those two weeks. They hurled all kinds of obscenities at us. What did they say? I don't want to use those words. <laughs> what did they say? Oh, nigger lover, jungle bunny, won't y'all go back to Africa? They punched us with sticks, with pins. A couple of people said, yeah, they're from the NACP. Yeah, that stands for niggas ain't acting like colored people. This guy who walked with a cane, he whittled the end of his cane down. He walked behind each of us and stuck us in the back with his cane. None of you ever said a word? Mm -mm. Never mm -mm. did anything? Never did anything, never said anything. Where were the police? Nowhere. They were a little skittish back in 2002 when they put this out for the first time. We had some people who were saying, if you raise this issue, you might be causing riots in the street. But it didn't. And in 2013, the release of the annual Race Relations Progress Report is front page news. More and more, I think people are recognizing that these are issues that have to be faced head on. Granted, to some, race is still a raw subject. But this isn't a race relations guilt report. It's a race relations progress report. We can't really talk about how we feel about each other. We can't deal with the relationships we have with each other as long as there are these deep-seated disparities in the quality of life that are race-based. So the JCCI, that's Jacksonville Community Council, Inc., examined the latest data. Public data sources, U.S. Census, hard data. And then compared QOL, that's quality of life, between the races in Jacksonville, and they found disparities. And they were pervasive. Everywhere we looked, we could measure them. They looked at six areas. Education, employment and income, public safety in the criminal justice system, neighborhoods and housing, politics and civic engagement. Here's some of what they found. The unemployment rate. 20 to 24 percent for blacks in Jacksonville. Depending on where in Jacksonville they live. Compared to about 9 percent for whites. You can go in parts of Jacksonville, you can go to entire streets where you have well over half of people that are no longer working because they just can't find work. Delinquent youth, the numbers for Jacksonville's blacks. It's still about double that of our white participation. But there's an encouraging footnote. 94 out of every 100 African-American youth are not involved with the juvenile justice system, and so the stereotypes that people have of young black males being thugs simply isn't true. Infant mortality when a child dies before the first birthday. The numbers spiking upwards for blacks, downward for whites, a widening gap that suggests inequities begin literally on day one. The latest figures, rates for Jacksonville's blacks more than quadruple, four times that of Jacksonville's whites. Our infant mortality rate for African Americans actually runs in the range that third world countries run. Here's a short list of countries you might consider backward, even primitive, but their IMR is on a par, and sometimes significantly lower than that of Jacksonville's blacks. And oddly enough... It wasn't that we needed greater neonatal technology. Instead, the problem starts way before the woman is pregnant, years before the baby is born. We had one doctor say to us that you can't, in nine months of prenatal care, overcome a lifetime of health neglect. 
Take something as simple as living near a supermarket. Did this young woman grow up in a place where there were access to fresh fruits and vegetables? Or did she grow up in a place near only convenience stores selling cookies, chips, and candy? Does Jacksonville have food deserts? A significant number of them, yes. Places where you won't find a supermarket for miles. In Jacksonville, food deserts thrive in predominantly black areas. The urban core, the north side, and west side. That's not healthy for a developing person. And deadly for her child. Unhealthy, undernourished mothers ultimately bear underweight, premature babies. And that's the greatest cause of infant mortality. Being black in America is a risk factor to the life of an infant. JCCI says adequately funded programs work, whether it's by government, foundations, or corporations. In two years' time, some of these programs together had saved the lives of 50 infants. But as these programs get cut... We were seeing those rates kick back up. The overall lesson we've seen in all of the work that we've been doing in the last 28 years on tracking data in Jacksonville is that when we as a community identify a problem and invest together in a solution, we can make things better. When we don't invest in a solution, when we cut programs and when we stop supporting the kinds of things that are working, then things get worse. When we make bad decisions, the fact is that babies die. The Progress Report does report some progress, mostly in the annual survey question. In the past year, do you think racism is a problem in Jacksonville? For more than a quarter century, JCCI has asked the question and consistently... Consistently have a higher percentage of African-American respondents saying that they felt racism was a problem than whites. Over the years, the gap was sizable, even staggering. Anywhere from a 15 to a 30 point gap. But not anymore. After 25 years, for the first time, blacks and whites responded almost exactly the same way, a statistical dead heat. It's about 56% of both white and black respondents said racism is a problem in Jacksonville. They're both even now. But they're both even. And suggesting, perhaps, that Jacksonville's whites are more sensitive to race than ever before. This helps us think about Jacksonville differently. For a long time, Jacksonville was what we called a tale of two cities. I'm not sure that that's an accurate descriptor anymore. We have consistently had this problem. What we haven't done is face it. Until maybe now. Well, we're a completely different community than we were 50 years ago. Not only that, we're a different community than we were 20 years ago. And in many important ways, we've made huge strides from where we were 10 years ago. We are interdependent. And as part of the community struggles, the whole community struggles. If we think of the community as a human body, we can't run very fast, we've got a broken ankle. Or if we shoot ourselves in the foot. And then it was August 27th, 1960. Axe Handle Saturday. The Klan had said that they were going to stop these niggas from marching. We knew it was going to be a terrible day. Everyone's on edge that Saturday morning. Alton Yates tells his new bride to stay inside. He said to me, do not leave the house, do not go outside. Rutledge Pearson hears that something's going down at Hemming Park. He drives there with Arnett Gerardo. There were ax handles sticking out of the shrubbery. And white men gathering, some in Confederate uniforms. I saw more hatred in their eyes than anything else I've ever seen. Not far away, Vance Goode, a 27-year-old police officer on downtown parking patrol, sees something strange. Three or four guys with axe handles. And I said, you know, this does not look right. Back at Hemming Park, Spencer Meeks watches from the windows of J.C. Penney. He sees axe handles going fast. When you saw that, what did you think? Lord have mercy, is there gonna be some killing? Meantime, Vance Goode questions the white men. What's this with the ax handles? And they said, well, we have axes at home that the handles are broken. So while we were downtown, we all just bought ax handles. Goode goes to the Robert Meyer Hotel, picks up the payphone and calls headquarters. And they said, well, keep an eye on everything and reporting it. And I said, okay. Returning to Laura Street Presbyterian Church, Rutledge Pearson talks to the kids in the youth council. All of them wanted to 
continue. But not at Woolworth. That's by the park, too close to the whites. It was decided that we would go to the W.T. Grant store so that these guys at Hemming Park wouldn't see us. Officer Goode, seeing more men with ax handles, calls in a second time. I says, you know, getting a crowd down here. I think you need to bring in some people to disperse this thing. And he says, keep an eye on it. About then, the kids from the youth council, broken up in small groups, go to Grant's. The mob saw them. And that's when it starts. Those kids inside Grant's have no idea what's about to hit them. At first, you don't know what it is. You could look up the street and see hordes of people. They all had ax handles and baseball bats. As the mob got closer and closer, then you could see that they were swinging at everything that looked black downtown. We went in all directions and just as fast as we could. You had to be wondering, where is my backup? Oh, I was, I was. By now, downtown is out of control. Two to 300 white men are hunting down black shoppers, black demonstrators, black women, black children, and beating the daylights out of them. Seeing the melee around Grants, another group of youth council kids, led by Alton Yates, retreat toward Hemming Park. And we went to Woolworth. And they came in and they started swinging these pack saddles and these baseball bats. And Alton Yates gets a blow to the head. The pain I don't remember. It's the ringing in my ears that I do remember. I saw them beat many blacks down to the ground. They beat the old lady down. I stood there helpless, couldn't do a thing. I see that lady take the whipping that she took with the ax saddles. Keep in mind, at this point, there's still apparently only one cop in the area. I saw a black man walking down the street in the group, swarmed around him and started beating him. I was saying, let me through here, let me through here. All right, stop, stop now. And I picked him up. Good takes the beaten bloody victim over to J.C. Penney. While he's inside, the white mob begins bashing another black man. And I did the same thing, walked through the crowd, went in and told him to stop. He calls headquarters a third time. I told him, better get somebody's ass down here right now. Soon after, the boomerangs show up, a gang of black teens just now getting word of the white riot. They're ready to rumble. They took the axe handles from the whites and began to beat them. And as the boomerangs arrive, so do the cops. Lots of them. Officer Goode's reaction? Where in the hell have you been? He says, we got it now. And I said, yeah. I probably said back to him, it's about damn time. The police move in and start arresting whites and blacks. I remember seeing a, a, a young black guy come around the corner by J.C. Penney's. He darted through the bushes. They grabbed him, pulled him out, and I remember one of the fellows hit him in the head with an axe handle. The policeman was doing nothing? Nothing. Stood there and looked around. I hate to even address that, but it was fact and I saw it and it was it stuck in my mind just like the fellow getting hit with the axe handle. One way or another, the kids of the youth council make it back to Laura Street. A lot of people weren't back yet, and you were worried and concerned about, um, about them. It was, uh, I cried. It was um, because you really didn't know 
where everybody was and what was going to happen next. You know, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was scary. By mid-afternoon, most blacks are out of downtown, including employees at Morrison's, except Nat Glover. I was the last one to leave out of that back door. About 15 whites immediately approach him. Some prod him with the ax handles. At that time, I wasn't too scared because the police officer was standing maybe, maybe 10 feet away from me. I ran over to the police officer, and I can remember what he told me, just like it was yesterday. You better get out of here before they kill you. By nightfall, the police locked down Ashley Street, the hub of the black community. Jacksonville experienced quite a night of violent racial confrontation by both black folk and white folk. Black cars were shot at and, and white cars were hit with rocks or had Molotov cocktails thrown at them. But whites with ax handles still lurk downtown. Around 11 p.m., Spencer Meeks is still inside Penny's hiding from the mob along with four co-workers. We decided we got to go home. All five of us got bob cutters and pulled a blaze out as long as we could get them. You were prepared to fight. To die. Prepared to die. The five walk out as the white men look on. What was going through your mind then? When will I feel the first ax hammer? The whites curse them, spit on them, but do nothing more. Nobody struck us. Well, right through the whole crowd with the box cutters in both our hands. You think it was the box cutters? I don't know whether he saw them or what, but I think it was just faith of God. That's what I think. Alton Yates makes it home around midnight. Far as anyone knows, the kids in the youth council are safe. He had been hit in the back of the head, and he carries that scar even today. What did you do? Just held him. I just held him and just was so thankful that he was, he was okay. It seems to me that in some ways Jacksonville hasn't changed very much. There's a small, very progressive society, but it's somewhat overwhelmed by a much more conservative society. There are times that it seems like Jacksonville is still in the 1950s. Some examples. The Florida Times Union produces an elaborate multi-page series commemorating the 50th anniversary of Axe Handle Saturday. But some readers are in no mood to memorialize the event. Why can't we just move on? Why can't we just forget about the past? Why can't we just let bygones be bygones? It's almost as if we're in a time warp. Only during the civil rights movement does everyone want to leave things in the past. As great and as courageous and as sacrificial as some of the folk were during the civil rights movement, you would think people would want to know what happened. An African-American man walks into a Mandarin supermarket to pick up a birthday cake for his daughter. And I asked the baker, do you have any African-American ballerinas to put on her birthday cake? She gives me what I call the evil stare. She turns to the other area of the bakery and in a very loud voice says, do we have any colored dancers to put on this cake? A Jacksonville councilman submits an odd request to this man, a Fulbright scholar, UNF professor, and a Muslim, nominated to serve on a little-known and non-paying city board. We'd like to ask you to say a prayer to your God. Could you do that for us here? That's all right. I have a reason that I would like for him to pray to his God. I think what we have is a lot of ignorance and a lot of fear. Forest High on Jacksonville's west side, named after the notorious Confederate general Nathan B. Forrest. Many historians say he led a massacre of black Union soldiers at the Battle of Fort Pillow in 1864 and later became the first Grand Wizard of the KKK. 
founder of the Ku Klux Klan, first imperial wizard of the Klan, and the Fort Pillow Butcher. Nothing redeeming about that. Half the student body at Forrest is black, but the Duval County School Board votes along racial lines to keep the name. I spoke at a university, and that was one of the first questions I got. Is it true that Jacksonville has a school named after the founder of the Ku Klux Klan? That's what people point to Jacksonville and laugh about. At one time, Nathan B. Forrest had dozens of schools named after him. Today, there's only two, the one in the general's hometown of Chapel Hill, Tennessee, the other in Jacksonville. The city council again, this time rejecting an amendment to Jacksonville's human rights ordinance, one that includes the LGBT community, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. What it says is that their access to housing, employment, and accommodation, meaning going to a restaurant, can't be precluded based on someone who decides that they look like they're gay and says, I don't want you here. That type of discrimination right now is without protection within the city ordinance. Job, housing, anything. Eating in a restaurant? Eating in a restaurant, anything. This person is a voting citizen. They live here, they pay their taxes. You have a right to eat where you want to eat. Do you see the parallel between that and Axe Handle Saturday? Absolutely, they're not different. The dynamic is the same. There are people in power who say, this is the way we're going to live in this community. And if you don't fit within that rubric, too bad. Well, in a democracy, that isn't how it works. History can teach us lessons, if we let it. If not, well, like the old saying goes, it just repeats itself. Jacksonville made the national news, and those axe handles gave the city a big black eye. It was up to Mayor Hayden Burns an outspoken segregationist, to put the proper PR spin on the story. Mel, were you surprised at this outbreak? Well, in the first place, it was not uncontrolled fighting that broke out. Let's get the record straight. The police were successful in placing themselves between the two groups and maintaining a distance of about 30 to 50 yards separation between the two groups. And not a single member of either group came in contact with an individual of the opposite group. Ask Charlie Griffin about that one. A mob of whites with ax handles pummeled him. Charlie was in the 11th grade. His picture got in Life magazine. No one was killed on ax handle Saturday. As for how many injured, 50, 70, 100, no one's really sure. Arrest reports also differ. The Times Union said 42. 33 blacks and nine whites. That afternoon, the black community held a mass meeting at St. Paul AME Church. The place was jammed. It sent the message that blacks are no longer gonna sit still. The youth council asked blacks to stop shopping and buying at downtown stores. There is one color that everybody understands and that's green. <laughs> it was another one of those turning points the black community was now united and empowered. I felt that at last, maybe I'm in control of my own destiny. The Youth Council asked Mayor Burns to create a biracial committee, if nothing else, just to open lines of communication. He refused. We decided we were going to have a biracial committee without the blessings of the mayor. So they did. Some whites on the committee relished this historical opportunity for change. Some didn't. But for everybody, it was awkward. Most of them had never sat in a meeting across the conference table with blacks. I mean, that just did not happen. But finally, after months of negotiations, much of it quite heated, downtown lunch counters quietly integrated in March 1961. And the day it happened, nothing happened. No cursing. No riots, no kicking of shins, no sticking with pins. The white waitress was fine. She came and waited on us, it was very pleasant. White customers displayed indifference. As for Alton Yates and his first meal at an integrated counter, he's certain of only one thing. What did you have? I don't remember. It wasn't a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, I can tell you that.
unless there are people who are willing to risk something, to put something on the line, change does not take place. In order for meaningful change to take place, somebody has to step out there and be willing to take a chance. Today, Alton Yates is retired after serving four Jacksonville mayors as an administrative aide and 32 years in the Air Force. Gwen Yates was elected to the Jacksonville City Council. So was Rodney Hurst. Marjorie Meeks Brown became Atlanta's first female postmaster. Spencer Meeks was the first black head coach and athletic director at Rebalt High School. Arnett Gerardo became the first black man elected to the Florida Senate. Nat Glover was the first black sheriff of Duval County. Jacksonville buried the memory of Axe Handel Saturday, then spent the next 40 years in denial. Dealing with it was just too much, too embarrassing. Then in 2000, the city came to terms with its past, not with a demonstration, but with a commemoration. Most everyone from the movement was there, except Rutledge Pearson the Pied Piper. Seven years after Axe Handle Saturday, he was killed in a car wreck on his way to Memphis. Imagine if he could have led his kids that one last time. Forty years later, when everyone extended a hand, not clenched a fist. Freedom is not free, Rutledge Pearson always said. Nor is it fast. Local media didn't exactly ignore Axe Handle Saturday, but they didn't go all out either. True, Jacksonville Journal ran a front page story, as did the Times Union, but both without photos. They did a story, but no photographs. We got the word from our editorial management not to cover the sit-in. They were rather emphatic that we were not to get involved in the coverage. I definitely didn't agree with that. So they went to plan B. But I told my staff, I said, if you want to go to lunch, you can go anywhere you want to, including Woolworths. Just don't take any company equipment. Take your own cameras if you're going to carry a camera. Did they take pictures? They did, but they're not in the Times Union's archives. I guess they figured if they ignored it, it would go away, or that it would be detrimental to the image of the city of Jacksonville. Sort of sickening. As a journalist, it's a real black mark as far as I'm concerned, but thank God things changed. Meantime, Channel 4, with legendary anchorman Bill Grove, showed up at Hemming Park to shoot film. Three of them went down there. That's my recollection. Grove, Bill Blackburn, and Claude Taylor. I heard that Bill Blackburn later saying, well, oh, it was terrible out there. What do you remember seeing on television? Oh, I remember the images so clearly of people racing through the streets, being knocked down, pushed down, bloodied heads. And by the time I get out of college, this will get settled. We'll have this settled. Little did I know four years later when I graduated, it hadn't been settled at all. In fact, the movement was just starting, along with accelerated coverage from the local media. But in 1960... How aggressive was Channel 4 in covering civil rights? I don't think very aggressive at all. I don't think anybody was. Not until the late 60s did Channel 4 begin covering civil rights in earnest. Bill Grove, he called me into his office one day and said, look, how do you feel about black people? I said, I don't, what, what do you mean, how do I feel? He says, do you have prejudices about black people? Do you have any, you know, no, no. We need to start doing some reporting on the black community. I'd like you to do that if you would. And so that was the beginning. But before all that happened, there was this. Time Magazine, September 12, 1960. Jacksonville, Florida is on page 27. 472 cutting words covering Axe Handle Saturday. The article is a devastating dissection of a city disengaged, dysfunctional, and divided. The article reveals Mayor Burns as a segregationist. The article calls Jacksonville a cracker town, more like South Georgia, than South Florida. But the coup de gras comes right in the first sentence, quoting a local priest, if Christ walked the streets of Jacksonville, 
he would be horrified. When city fathers and the Jacksonville Chamber of Commerce read the Time article, they were probably horrified too. After all, by 1960, they had spent a decade portraying Jacksonville as a progressive southern oasis. They wanted to bring in business, relocate corporations from the North and Midwest, attract attention and dollars and new blood. In that sense, the Jacksonville of 1960 and the Jacksonville of 2013 are much the same. But today, blowback is magnified exponentially. Here's just one example. If I were head of a company in Minneapolis, I wouldn't bring it to Jacksonville now. I wouldn't even dream of it. All of those companies have gay employees. Some of them may be run by gays or senior officers are gays. Do you think they're going to want to come to Jacksonville that won't even pass a human rights ordinance? How do you think Jacksonville looks to the rest of the country when it sends that kind of a message? We don't look good. The main competition between cities today is, is who can access talented people. And if you put out a sign that says uh, talented gays are not welcome, you're not going to get very far. The consultants won't even show the company Jacksonville because they don't want them to spend money, fly down here, look at Jacksonville, and then it pops up one of their gay senior vice presidents say, well, I'm not going to Jacksonville. Our kids, my grandkids, won't believe we fought over this issue. Just like it's hard to believe now that people got beaten with ax handles. Until we make room for all of our citizens, all of our citizens, we aren't a complete and whole city. Even those opposed to the amendment are willing to talk. I believe in rights for everybody, not just favored rights. So you're open to meeting with them? How soon you want to do it? The tag glued on Jacksonville generations ago, this catchphrase, a city with great potential. They said that in 1888, when Jacksonville hosted the Subtropical Exposition, sort of a primitive Disney World, remarkable for its time, a stunning showcase for the city. They said it nearly a century later, when Jacksonville rebranded and became the bold new city of the South. But somehow, places like Atlanta and Miami and Tampa were bolder. And in 2013, that label now seems like an annoying old albatross draped across a tired old town. If we continue to be the largest city in Florida without these basic, just basic civil rights protections, if we continue to fall behind even smaller communities, Jacksonville will look even more like a relic. Companies will continue to pass us by. Young people will continue to go away to college and never return to Jacksonville. These are the stakes. But this generation controls the remote. We can wallow in reruns of the Flintstones or hit the reboot button and join the Jetsons in the 21st century. That's the one place where maybe one day racism, prejudice, and discrimination are found only in a museum. Perhaps adjacent to the Allosaurus exhibit, something else that's extinct. It took a giant asteroid with a force of 100 million megatons to extinguish the dinosaurs. Something much less, a hardened and heavy heart, will do the same to us. <laughs>